Hi there everybody, my name is Ollie. I'm a junior doctor working in the UK and welcome back to my series on clinical emergencies for medical school and PA school finals as well as the upcoming AFP slash SFP interviews. Today's video is all about pulmonary embolism, PE, but before we move on I have to give the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes only, it's not to be used as a guideline for clinical decision making, it's intended for medical and PA students to get them through their final year's exams and not by any means a substitute for proper qualification or clinical training. Secondly, as with every video in this series, it comes along with a free summary sheet and an Anki deck, which you can add to your own studied resources, and the way you get that is after you've watched the video, go down to the description, fill out the feedback form, you'll find the link down there, and once you've done that, you'll get the link to the free study resources afterwards. I'd really appreciate it, it really helps me out. Let's start with the basics and remind ourselves what exactly a PE, a pulmonary embolism is. Now by definition, an embolus is a clot or an element causing a blockage that is formed somewhere else in the body. Typically in a PE, we think about the legs in the form of a DVT, a deep venous thrombosis, Sometimes a section of these larger clots can break off, travels all the way through the circulation, passing into smaller and smaller and smaller vessels until eventually it gets stuck. Now PEs are one of those things that healthcare workers need to remain generally vigilant for because by the time signs and symptoms do start to appear, they are quite non-specific and difficult to pick apart from other emergencies which can present in very similar ways. There is therefore a real focus on the prevention of PEs and thinking actually more upstream, prevention of DVTs, these deep venous thromboses which can typically give rise to PEs. And DVTs are by far the most common cause of PEs and account for about 90% of cases. It's also really important to be aware therefore of the common scenarios that can lead to the formation of DVTs which include having recent surgery, immobility for long periods such as lying in a hospital bed, bony fractures, cancer, obesity, infection, even pregnancy, and some types of medication, including the combined oral contraceptive pill. And the reason why this is important to think about is that ultimately, if we have a patient who develops a PE, we will have to make a decision as to whether this PE was either unprovoked, meaning that there was no obvious cause behind the formation of the clot, or provoked, the situation was such that a PE was more likely to form in this patient. The most common signs and symptoms of a PE are pleuritic chest pain, which is really important to differentiate from cardiac chest pain. A pleuritic chest pain being a sharp pain that is worse on breathing in, whereas with cardiac pain, typically that's more diffuse, heavy, and non-specific. And sometimes in PE patients, we will see hemoptysis, that is coughing up small amounts of blood. Later signs, people might start to develop cyanosis, that's a bluish dusky tinge to the lips and tongue, and eventually hemodynamic instability. And diagnosing a PE, especially under pressure, is hard, it's not a simple endeavour, because these clinical manifestations are either very non-specific, potentially very mild, or sometimes not even present at all. The very first thing that we need to do in a suspected case of PE is calculate a Wells score. I'll overlay all of the clinical criteria on screen right now, but in practice when you're on the wards, digital tools like MD Calc is the one I use on the ward, can make things very quick. The two really key criteria within the Wells score that really inflate the score. The first is clinical features of a DVT, that is a unilateral swollen calf that is painful on palpation of the deep veins. And secondly, an alternative diagnosis being less likely than a PE, both of which will contribute three points. Now this is the bit that many people get confused about and I'll try and keep it as simple as possible. The Wells score is a test to decide if a PE is likely or not. Therefore, if the Wells score is 4 or greater, that patient warrants an immediate CTPA, that is a CT pulmonary angiogram, which is going to examine the vessels supplying the lungs. Contrast is injected into these vessels to very quickly and easily identify a clot, and it is very, very sensitive and very specific for PE. It is the gold standard test. 
Now, just to quickly say that while the CTPA is rapidly becoming the gold standard for investigating PE, the other option is ventilation perfusion lung scintigraphy, commonly known as a VQ scan, which because of its lower radiation dose than CT, is sometimes preferred in pregnant patients because it's a lower dose of radiation to the breast tissue, or indeed in younger patients. Now, if the Wells score is less than four, this makes a PE unlikely. So what we're trying to do is then rule out a PE. So we order a test called a D-dimer. Now, D-dimer is a protein that is released when clots in the body are broken down. It's a natural product of fibrin degradation. That is to say, the fibrin protein gets broken down and the D-dimer gets its name because it's got two D segments from the overall fibrin protein. Now, if this process is going to take more than four hours, we will start our patient on some anticoagulation now, but we'll talk more about that later. And the golden rule is please, please, please never order a D-dimer without going through your clinical reasoning first. It causes more problems than it solves, as the D-dimer is very non-specific and it will be high in a huge number of patients that have nothing wrong with them. So now let's work through a clinical scenario together. You are a foundation year one doctor working in orthopedic surgery. You're chatting to one of your patients on the ward when a patient in a nearby bed calls you over and says he doesn't feel very well. Mr. Hussain is a 53-year-old gentleman admitted following an open tibial fracture five days ago. As you examine him, one of the nurses follows you into the bay to tell you that Mr. Hussain's daily anoxaparin dose is too low for his weight. As you begin to examine him, one of the nurses follows you into the bay to tell you that Mr. Hussain's daily tinzaparin dose is too low for his weight. Now, why am I bringing this up? This is because the vast majority of hospital inpatients receive daily anticoagulation of some kind. Most commonly, a low molecular weight heparin, such as anoxaparin, deltaparin, tinzaparin, pick your poison. This is done obviously for the purposes of venous thromboembolism prophylaxis, but they have to be dosed according to the patient's weight. If the dose is too low or doses are being missed, this obviously places our patient at an increased risk of developing a clot. So now let's work through our A to E examination. Starting with the airway, it's patent. The patient is clearly in some pain as they're talking to you, but they're maintaining their airway no problem. Respiratory rate is 22, good respiratory effort, but breaths are catching with pain. Air entry sounds normal in both lungs, oxygen saturations are 92% on air, and arterial blood gas is done which shows a type 1 respiratory failure. Moving on to C, the heart rate is 140 beats per minute and regular, capillary refill time of 2 seconds, heart sounds are normal, blood pressure of 118 over 68, and ECG is performed indicating sinus tachycardia. All of you will have heard of the classic textbook S1Q3T3, ECG phenomenon associated with PEs, it's rarely seen in practice and should not be relied upon for diagnosis of PEs. Moving on to D, temperature is 37.2 degrees, most recent blood glucose 8.0, pupils equally responsive and reactive to light, and E for exposure, nil obvious, the calves are soft non-tender and of equal size. As you examine Mr. Hussain's legs, he coughs into a tissue and shows you flecks of blood. So at the moment, based on all of this, Mr. Hussain is fairly clinically well. He's certainly hemodynamically stable. This gives us some time to calculate our Wells score for a suspected PE. So now let's work through our scoring system. Clinically, I don't think we actually have enough evidence to suspect a DBT in this man. He certainly doesn't have the physical examination signs, so that's going to be a zero. An alternative diagnosis is less likely given that we have signs and symptoms of a PE, so that's going to be plus three. He is tachycardic, that's another 1.5. He has had surgery and has been immobilized, that's another 1.5. He hasn't had a previous DVT or PE that we know about. He does have hemoptysis, that's plus one and he has no malignancy that we know of and isn't palliative. So all of this put together gives us a combined Wells score of seven, which is more than enough to trigger the threshold for when we need to do a CTPA. Remember, it's four or greater. A CTPA is performed, which thankfully for us <laughs> identifies the PE, and the consultant decides to commence treatment when she decides to use 10 milligrams of apixaban as per your trust guidelines. Now, some trusts will still use treatment doses of low molecular weight heparin, so it's important as ever to be aware of your local trust policies. 
and in this case Mr. Hussain needs to remain on this dose for at least three months after this event because we would consider this a provoked PE. If we didn't have an obvious cause, remember this would be unprovoked and he would need to be treated for at least six months. Now briefly I want to touch on the idea of a massive PE, which you might have heard of, that is a PE that is so significant in size that it causes hemodynamic compromise and therefore there is a significantly dropped blood pressure which is normally taken to be below 90 millimeters of mercury systolic. Then the other option is to thrombolize, that is to use an enzyme to simply break down the clot. Now the European Society of Cardiology and the British Thoracic Society both recommend alteplase as the first line agent, a typical dose being 100 milligrams IV infused over at least two hours. And just as we begin to wrap up this video, I want to quickly revisit this idea of clinical likelihood, because sometimes a degree of searching to inform your treatment is needed. You may consider an ultrasound leg to potentially find a DVT, or a chest x-ray to maybe show you a PE in situ. Indeed, a transthoracic echo will find a massive PE. Because there is no real single test short of your CTPA or your imaging, it is often purely a question of clinical judgment and experience, and certainly as a new junior, I've found getting my seniors involved as soon as possible to be really helpful. Lastly, there are two other scoring systems to be aware of when it comes to PEs. I don't think you need to know them as much as you need to know about the Wells score, but they are useful and at least knowing what they are used for is going to help you get through your vivas. The first is the PERC rules, the pulmonary embolism risk calculator, which is essentially useful to try and rule out a PE. If none of the criteria are present, there is a less than 2% chance that your patient has a PE. And the second one to be aware of is the PESI score or the pulmonary embolism severity index. And this one can be helpful to have ready once you've done your treatment and once you're handing over to either your senior, like your registrar, or another team of doctors, and this is a set of 11 criteria that essentially calculates the 30-day mortality risk for this patient. There is a simplified version available as well, but this isn't going to acutely help you. It's more when you're handing over to another team, it gives you an idea of how at risk that patient is. So that's it guys, thank you very much for watching. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to go and check out ollieburton.com for more free content just like this. Take care and I'll see you next time.